I just want to um, say something about the publishers. Uh, this book was designed by um, uh, Jenny Zimmer from Palgrave Macmillan, and Palgrave Macmillan does a fantastic job for Australian artists and Australian art writers. Um, Jenny is a pioneer in this regard, and I was talking to Tim um, before, and he said, when Jenny dies, everybody's going to really, really miss what she does, because she puts a lot of uh, books out there on, in the marketplace that really would not get published if it wasn't for her. And some of this work is uh, collaborative in terms of, uh, of uh, getting the funds to produce these books. So this book was also funded by the Australia Council by a, uh, via a new work grant and also a small subsidy from my own faculty, the Faculty of Art and Design at Monash University. Um, so um, uh, I, I just wanted to say thank you really to Palgrave Macmillan for taking this on. They also published my uh, a uh, book I did previously on photography called The Dark Room, Photography in the Theatre of Desire, which is a rereading of the history of photography since um, 1839 uh, from a performative point of view. And one of my missions in life has been to put Australian contemporary artists um, on the international agenda, and that was definitely the, the uh, impetus behind The Dark Room. Uh, but today uh, I'm here to talk to you about my latest book, Look, Contemporary Australian Photography Since 1980, which was also funded by Australian Research Council grant, which went from 2005 to the end of 2008. Um, so I was lucky to have a research assistant on that book, and any of you, there are some of you in the audience that, would have, that are actually contributors to the book. And uh, I'd also like to thank Melissa Miles, who helped uh, significantly with... Uh, writing the captions. In fact, she wrote the first draft of most of the captions for the book, which then went through various iterations. The book, I wanted to present a book where the photographs drove the book. The photographs were actually the thing that you would see most in the book and to give some factual rather than interpretive um, uh, captions for the reader. So the idea is that the, the book can be read just through its photographs. Um, and the academic work is at the back of the book, so those academic essays are at the back of the book uh, with a, a fairly long timeline, which has also got some contrib contributors from uh, major curators. Um, so, um, what I'm doing today is drawing some comments from the uh, introduction of the book. So, uh, we're starting with the front cover, obviously. Um, and I'm going to go through the photographs which are then tagged on the screen so you'll see uh, who, that, who they are. So the period from 1980 to the present represents one of the most dynamic times for art photography. During this time, photography comes of age in the art world. No longer the poor cousin of the fine arts, which was, we inherited that from Baudelaire, but now photography enters the galleries and the market with a kind of swagger never before seen in the history of art. It is the new medium that embraces 20th and 21st century ideas. It is reproducible, democratic and easily distributed. It breaks with the established high art traditions of taste. It takes art off its pedestal and speaks widely to an audience already familiar with popular cinema. These photographs um, compete with paintings in scale and they fascinate a public hungry for pictures that speak of the complexities of life and a medium that is sophisticated but familiar. Uh, these are the themes that the, the photographs are collected in themes, identity, life, experiment, place, performance and environment and the, these are the critical essays. So the book represents over 400 pictures which are grouped together in these themes, environment, life, identity, space and experiment. And some of these themes have sub-themes, beach, sky, youth. Each theme has a short introduction and every photograph has an extended caption. Uh, this allows the viewer to read the pictures at random or in edited sections. And at the back of the book, as I said before, a series of critical essays which analyse curatorial and theoretical issues and a timeline detailing important exhibitions and events. Um, the 
there are various research questions that drove uh, the essays and also the, cur the huge curatorial practice of, of, of getting the, the uh, pictures together. Um, I, I advertised, and um, anybody that's done major research will tell you that you, you shouldn't mushroom your calls, but I wanted to mushroom my calls for s expressions of interest. So we sent it out through every alternative art space that would have an advert, uh, all, all the lists of galleries um, through... Um, through friends and uh, curators and collectors. And I stopped um, accepting expressions of interest in being part of the book when I started to get wedding photographers from Townsville. Um, one of my younger colleagues said I shouldn't have stopped and I should have included them as well, but I told him that was his project. Um, so um, then, of course, there was this huge curatorial um, uh, you know, decision making that had to go on and I'm happy to talk to people about that later if you're interested in asking me questions about it, like why I chose these pictures and not others. Um, I was saying uh, after, about 18 months into the research that if there's a, there's, every time I go into a gallery there's a, a new photographer is born every nanosecond and that was in, uh, you know, 2006-2007. Um, the selection of images for each theme provides a visual dialogue, I'm hoping, for the, for the viewer. In environment, for example, viewers will find a range of approaches to landscape photography, including photographs which deal with environmental and ecological issues. Land has been a dominant theme in Australian photography since the 19th century. Mark Kimber digitally reconfigures landscape from the art historical archive and places his own photographs within them to create mysterious and witty fictive landscapes in this series. Ro this is Rosemary Lang. Um, and uh, for those of you that don't know, this isn't digitally manipulated so much as she had carpet layers going to the forest and actually laid the carpet. Um, in contemporary practice, artists are often concerned with promoting, uh, with prompting, sorry, the viewer to think rather than seducing the viewer's eye with a romantic scene. Although um, landscape photography is sometimes associated with the beautiful and the sublime, it is also a political environment. Land degradation due to human negligence and nature and natural disasters recurs, and these are represented in the book. Um, Indigenous Australians have made, a very powerful, have made very powerful photographic works which address the colonial archive and, landscape, uh, and land rights issues. Landscape and urban and architectural space are indicators of place and history and are significant for many people. These are often contested spaces, one shot, ones shot through with conflict and power, and power struggles as different people make different claims on land and space. I've tried to put in as many South Australian artists as I could actually, not all of them, but I tried to do that when I was making the PowerPoint. Um, Australia has often promoted, as you know, uh, itself as a multicultural society, but it's also a society that has struggled to recognise its Indigenous people. Colonial heritage and its cultural and political baggage can be seen throughout this book. There is a strong Indigenous presence in contemporary photography and some Indigenous Australian artists uh, uh, recognise, uh, uh, um, actually uh, note that they are Indigenous and others don't. Um, so you can't always uh, guess uh, the identity of the photographer on those grounds. Um, I like this juxtaposition, of course, because Alan Cruikshank is not Indigenous. Um, so there's, there's also a plethora of difference as artists from other cultures have arrived <coughs> in waves of immigration. Australia was established as a prison garrison in the 18th century to house felons from England. And although federation, democracy and a modern political state have civilised this history, the colonial past is embedded within the national psyche. In contemporary photography, this cultural memory is played out in themes of identity and space where historical memory and political advocacy find a voice. This is Jane Eisman. Um, in many respects, contemporary photography can't escape the world of ideas and theory. It is already caught in a sophisticated web. 
Now, although many artists took up photography because it was a mechanical medium, they quickly realised that this ease of manufacture actually came at a price. Photography may well be everyone's art, but it's also everyone's burden. Photography comes to us loaded with culture and power. There's no such thing as an innocent picture. Um, theory and photography have always gone hand in hand and photography has been seduced by philosophy. Contemporary art photography has engaged with postmodern theory in various ways. In the late 1970s and 1980s, there was a politicisation of this nexus. To some extent, this has been a result of theory focusing on photography. Indeed, one prominent art historian, Rosalind Krauss, claimed that photography became an object of theory in the 1980s. So pho photography itself becomes an object of theory. However, photographers and critics were aware of the philosophical impact of photography from its inception when inventors wrote about the virtual image. So people were talking about the virtual image in the 19th century. They were also talking about, of course, the negative positive process and the archive of memory. Many scholars have used photography as a metaphor for history and memory. And Sigmund Freud famously made an analogy between the photographic process and the conscious and unconscious mind. And of course, he was talking about analogue photography. Um, the 1980s was a pivotal decade. Conceptual art was using photography in mundane ways. Feminists were looking at the ways in which <coughs> women were objectified by the gays and activists were hoping to collect evidence of inequality. From the 1980s onwards, all ph photographers knew that they were playing within a field of power which was already corrupted. Although in the 1980s, uh, although the 1980s is often considered to be a, a decade of postmodern theory, there was really a lot going on. So I want to talk about photography as a medium of our times. So we might say that photography is a narrative medium, capable of telling stories about the world and investing social, uh, investigating social and political issues. It's also a medium which propels the operator of the camera to think about what he or she is doing. And that's the point with Anne Ferrin's scenes from the death of nature, I think, apart from it addressing, obviously, fe the feminist issue of the gaze. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that the mechanism itself is self-conscious. It insists that the photographer recognise the apparatus. Um, so to photograph something is to engage with a process. Voyeurism, narcissism, surveillance are immediate in the language of photography as soon as one picks up the apparatus, as soon as one picks up the camera. The apparatus inscribes the way of seeing and knowing the world and in so doing it implicates both the subject and the object in a nexus of fetishism and power. This is what makes photography seductive. Time is one of the base elements of photography, but the idea that it is a slice of life is often confounded by cinematic staging and digital manipulation. In recent practice, we also find artists slowing time down and returning to old analog techniques. This is Ian de Gucci's projections on buildings. Um, Renata Buziak, who I discovered in um, Brisbane when I was going around and going to art schools in particular and asking people I knew in art schools, hey, who are the up-and-coming artists? Um, and I found Renata in, in, in Brisbane. And one of the cool things for me about this book was I was making, I was having to make a kind of 
fairly dangerous kind of decisions about whether these younger artists that I found really compelling were actually going to make the distance. Like when the book came out, they were still going to be practicing. Um, but I, I, after this curatorial process that I talked about before, um, they all have. It's just amazing. In fact, now you don't even think they're emerging because they're all. But they've all always. They already emerged. So, um, but they were at the time in 2005, 2006, emerging artists. Um, so what Renata's doing here is she's creating images by simply putting foliage and plant material onto photographic paper and waiting, often for many, many months, for, fem for chemical processes to react and to literally make a picture. This could be seen as a contemporary manifestation of um, William Henry Fox Talbot's idea that nature does the work in photography. Um, the profile of the photographer has really changed over the last 30 years as photography has moved squarely into the art scene. Uh, most of the pictures in this book are made by artists using photography. These people identify as artists who make photography. Many of them also make artwork in other media and they slide across uh, categories depending on the ideas that they want to investigate. So they're not exclusively photographers, but artists that are using photography. Some of them are exclusively photographers, but not all of them. So what I'm suggesting is there's, there's no longer a clear distinction between um, genres or types of photography. So we see this kind of slippage between fashion, advertising, documentary and art photography. And as a result of postmodernism, we're all codes um, were considered equally, we have inherited a merger of visual codes. So you'll, you'll know that advertising often looks like art now and fashion photography creates narratives. Documentary truths are staged and visual, and of course this is part of this convergence of visual language. Um, contemporary photography has been influenced by the cinematic and the televisual. The slippage into screen culture via digital media is a dominant factor both in amateur and professional photography. It's also apparent that there's a nostalgia for old media. Photography, for photographers in the 1990s and 2000s were utilising the lighting effects and multi-crude um, directorial processes of filmmaking, but they were doing this with a sense of nostalgia in some instances. Um, Jane Burton. So the, scene, the scenes these photographers, and I'm using Jane Burton as an example, the scenes the photographers seek, seek to emulate are often moments from auteur cinema, but the look encapsulates a psychological state rather than being a homage to the auteur, auteur film itself. It's a bit like Cindy Sherman's film stills, you know. They're not actually film stills from a particular film. You can't go back to the original film. Um, so photographers uh, are looking for dramatic ways to present the dark underside of society. Existential anxiety, psychological obsessions and neurotic afflictions are the substance of our times and photographers portray this in, uh, in their images. Uh, Bill Henson's a famous example, although he would say that it's, he would talk more about the form of the, of, the, of the photographs that he's making, but he's also um, talks about opera when he's talking about his works. Uh, these have been very compelling and controversial images, of course. Um, okay. So the te televisual influence that I'm talking about is perhaps more subtle, uh, but it's also invasive. The recurrence of the mundane presents a critique of the fashion, or of fashion, but also of real-time TV. As with the cinematic, the televisual effect in photography often comes with an overload of irony. Alienated youth, uninhabited rooms and urban nothingness are recurrent. However, this genre is also looking to the past, to the history of the medium. Street photography um, and documentary have been reborn within art photography. 
The slippage between art and documentary photography is compelling as documentary takes on the spectacle and art takes on the mundane. So we've seen this kind of shift happening. And I'm going to just briefly um, talk about this um, artist photographer um, and um, talk about this slippage between um, art and the mundane and uh, the spectacle of documentary. So today, artists are not tending to make fantastical works that are obviously manipulated. Indeed, they seem to be using the digital to enhance a reality effect. In some instances, the result is an impossible reality. The influence of uh, televisual and cinematic ways of seeing are also, in, uh, also apparent and have been for some time. Now, Gail Newton argues that today, and I quote from her, documentary is bicultural and practised with more latitude. She also says that we're experiencing a fusion across genres which is breaking down borders and opening into a new visual culture paradigm. Now, Newton, in one of the most lucid essays on the new approaches to documentary, presents an analysis of the Leica CCP, Centre for Contemporary Photography, Documentary Photography Award um, of 2003 and its winning um, entry by Domenico Cosolino, which is titled, as you can see, Arcadia del Sud, West Heidelberg, Melbourne, Australia, circa 1966. And the, the work was made in, or remade in 2003. Now, Cosolino's um, suite of eight digitally manipulated photographs, each of which measured 80 by 120 centimetres, were originally taken when he was 12 years old. In some ways, these, were th these are re-photographs because Cosolino scanned the poor quality negatives from the 60s and then threw them more out of focus than uh, they originally were to underline what he says, the indistinctness of memory itself. The pictures show ordinary moments from the artist's domestic life with his Italian um, immigrant parents in the then outer working class suburb of West Heidelberg. Newton draws attention to the literal title of the work and argues that they recall the ponderous titles of narratives of exploration as well as the historic place of Heidelberg as the home of the Australian Impressionists in the 19th century. Cosolino's award-winning series also has its genesis in found or reconstituted photographs. Newton is quick to make a comparison with Jackie Redgate's um, photographic series, which you may know and I forgot to put in the PowerPoint, which is in the book, uh, which is called Photographer Unknown, a portrait chronicle of photographs of in England, 1953 to 62, which likewise um, re uh, resurrects amateur snapshots from her own family or extended family album. There's an irony, I think, in all of this where artists are using vin vernacular photographs, but Cosolino was, as Newton notes, stress testing the term documentary. And it really would have been impossible for him to win the documentary award uh, in previous decades, simply because the boundaries between the genres in photography were zealously patrolled. The boundary between documentary and even photojournalism was, was zealously patrolled, let alone between those uh, kinds of photography and art photography. Um, so not so long ago, um, most photographs, probably not in your lifetime, but certainly in mine and, and Mark's, um, most photographs in galleries were small 8 by 10 inch black and white prints. The history of this fine art photography, as it came to be known, stretches back to the early uh, 20th century where it struggled to get recognition as art. And any of you who's doing photo media will know this whole story about you know, how photography wasn't considered art for a long, long time. Baudelaire considered it to be um, you know, the poor cousin of the fine arts. It could only be its handmaiden, in his words. And so it struggled for a long time uh, to get recognition as, as, as art. And some people, even today, still don't think that photography is art, but they're just misinformed. 
Um, so despite its small scale, um, in, even up into, to, into the 70s, photography nevertheless spoke very loudly to a mass audience through magazines and books. And this is kind of one of the other reasons why it wasn't considered art by the art cognoscenti. Um, so we might say that um, this is, I, I found this, I found this artist on a billboard on Punt Road and then went looking for her. Um, so we might say that photography has always been everywhere. In fact, Geoffrey Batchin famously says that photography is um, everywhere but nowhere in particular, which I think is a good quote. So it's everywhere. It's in newspapers and magazines, in advertising and on billboards. And of course, Naomi Sunner is exploiting this um, in 2006. So people became familiar with photographs and they were taking <coughs> thousands of photographs themselves of their families, their holidays, their travel experiences and so forth. Of course, Bourdieu, the French sociologist, who I love to hate, um, says that photography is a middle-brow art, you know, and everybody's taking the same photographs. You know, the photograph you take of your loved one in front of the ivory tower is the same as um, the person sitting next to you takes. It's just the same photographs, just a different person there. I mean, it's got a point, but, you know, it's, it's laboured terribly. Um, so photography becomes everyone's art. Everyone does it. It's part of vernacular culture. Um, um, but this vernacular culture kind of seeps into the, into the art world. And I think what we've got uh, recently with the mundane um, kind of style, if you like, of photography of empty rooms, for example, uh, in the art galleries is part of this um, almost celebration of the vernacular or the underlining of the vernacular. Um, and another person that loves the vernacular is Patrick Pound, who I'm juxtaposing here with uh, Anne Ferrin. I'm not sure why. I just think it looked good. Um, so photography has, ex ha has really expanded um, in the last decade at least through digital and electronic media. The camera is no longer an analogue medium exclusively. It's no longer this analogue medium that shoots still pictures. It's now a smart mobile phone, which is what um, Patrick Pound uses, or a digital device that interfaces seamlessly with the World Wide Web, allowing for the mass distribution of images. And we know that this mass distribution of images often uh, creates uh, incredible controversy in the world. Just think back a few years ago about the Abu Ghraib photographs that were taken by soldiers you know, torturing uh, people. Um, and, and the controversy that uh, happened because of that. And that was because of the seamless slippage uh, that's available at the moment. Um, so this has created um, this kind of social menace, if you like, uh, but also a free press. Um, the camera and the pictures it takes are imploding in our world. In fact, some people say there are too many images and they might be right. The photographers and artists in this book came of age during a period in which the photographic was celebrated and critiqued as a way of knowing the world. This was a vital time for photo practice because much of the critical theory which seduced people referred to photography or a photographic way of seeing. Um, from the late 1980s, photography and the photographic were centre stage. Photography was the medium in the visual arts that was capturing everyone's attention. Recent surveys of international art from the 1960s to the, the present invariably end with rooms of photography and video. It's a 21st century phenomenon that breaks with the past and accepts technological innovation. Douglas Crimp argued some time ago that the photographic activity of postmodernism presented a profound threat to painting, the medium, authenticity and originality. But he went on to say, and I quote from him, it is also symptomatic of a more limited and internecine threat, the one posed to painting when photography itself suddenly acquires an aura. Now it's not only a question of ideology, now it's a real competition for the acquisition budget and wall space of the museum. Um, 
This signifies a radical shift for the art market, which traditionally deals in original works of art, painting and sculpture, art which supposedly cannot be reproduced easily. But in many ways this is a myth. Any sculpture cast in metal or plastic is easily reproducible. We've all got a Rodin in our national galleries. In fact, I was in your national gallery on the weekend when I was here last on the weekend. Um, you've got a Rodin and it's not an original. It's a, it's, a, it, it, it is repro it's a reproducible sculpture because it was a cast. So both of these uh, things, the cast sculpture and the, and the analog photograph, depend on a negative positive process of production which allows for the original to be reproduced. Now photography, the most reproducible medium, commands extraordinary prices in the art market. And you all, all know some of the um, well, would be international, uh, usually American or, or Canadian artists like Jeff Wall, who, who only makes one photograph and sells it for a million dollars. Um, so, and the, tra the Tracy Moffat, I showed you before, something more, the signature image from Tracy Moffat, which is actually a photograph of herself, um, commanded a huge um, prices uh, in the market when I was writing this book, like $750,000 for the one image, something like that. Um, so there's much to be learnt from the current boom in art photography. Most significant is that photography has challenged the art world's predisposition for originals. And in so doing, it has moved the art market into the 21st century. It's created a whole new market for art. Um, of course, the dealers that are running galleries are really excited because you know, new markets are a great thing. Capitalism keeps on propelling new markets and so it's good. But it's also good for the art world, I think, and for practitioners. So contemporary art photography has taken centre stage in art centres across the world in the last 20 years. This is not a Eurocentric uh, avant-garde. On the contrary, art photography emanates from all corners of the globe. China, India, Korea, Russia, South America, South Africa and Australia have all contributed to this global phenomenon. International biennales are full of photography and video art. Photography is an old and a new medium. Artists embrace the digital and explore old techniques such as pinhole photography, photograms, liquid light and stereographic, stereoscopic views. Some use the most sophisticated equipment with elaborate lighting and teams of people to help stage um, directorial photo shoots. Others use tiny plastic cameras, mobile phones and low technology to create blurred and atmospheric images. Some artists use series and installation to challenge the medium of photography itself, which I'm kind of very interesting in. There's a whole chapter in the book about the medium. These artists are concerned with the medium. Their work pushes the boundaries of what photography is visually, materially, historically and theoretically. They engage with photography as an idea, photography as a concept. And you remember I said before that Rosalind Krauss says that photography became the object of theory, a theoretical object. And anybody that's read any, you know, Roland Barthes will see how quickly that theory is propelled by, uh, that philosophical theory is propelled by ph photography. It, it, it's compelled by it in lots of ways. And if you don't believe me, read Roland Barthes' Camera Lucida or um, A Lover's Disc, um, what's the other one? Roland Barthes by Roland Barthes, which is more a... A, a, a book about the pictures um, as well as the photographs. So if you're not into tracks of theory, which Camera Lucido isn't really, but Roland Barthes by Roland Barthes is the book for you. Um, so in the, um, in the 21st century, the photographic is everywhere. It, and I like to think of it as a virus which infects all other media. I don't think we can think of other media now without thinking about photography because there's so much blurring of the boundaries but also this infecting, this in infecting like a virus uh, and, and viruses are good. Anybody that's uh, into cyber culture knows that viruses are actually good. Um, so it's a virus that infects other media. So photography's challenged the authority of the fine art tradition. 
In many respects, it's emerged as a very enigmatic medium, and maybe it's a kind of feminine medium, but it's also the bad woman within the world of high art. It masquerades as the other, it tricks the gaze, and reproduces the original endlessly, and in so doing, it subverts the authority of the master. I'll leave it there. And I'm very happy to take questions and discussions, uh, to open discussion.